Hi, uh, I'm Adam on the Geek, and this is a Europhile review. It's the first um, video review I've done in this uh, series of reviews, uh, and at the moment it seems to be the first um, video review of Winter Tales. Uh, Winter Tales is just a, a beautiful game that's caught my attention over the last few months, and I've written about it quite a lot on Board Game Geek. Um, either sort of enthusiastically talking about the gameplay or uh, writing strategy guides and that sort of thing. Um, it's by a company called Alve Pavo, uh, who also did um, Sake and Samurai and Beer and Vikings, uh, another game called Minira, which I'm not very familiar with. I probably pronounced their name wrong as well. Um, but, but there's going to be a Fantasy Flight edition. That's been announced recently, which is great news because it, it deserves a wider distribution. Um, when I first noticed the game, it was at Essen, it was on display and you couldn't walk by, you know, without spotting the, the beautiful um, twisted sort of fairy tale art here, the, um, the sort of nightmare before Christmas um, sort of aesthetics of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a story of fairy tale characters fighting against each other in a sort of Narnia-esque um, permanent winter um, and oppression uh, by these uh, fairy tale characters gone bad. Um, and, and this is a storytelling game, okay? Uh, there are cards in it. We have cards which we use to, uh, we spend them to move around the board and position ourselves strategically. We have cards which we use to, to bid against each other, uh, blind bidding and, and, and play battles against each other. And, you know, so far so Euro. But this is more than that. This is not like any other board game that you're going to have played um, because it has such a strong storytelling aspect to it. Um, and uh, the cards are used in a way which may be familiar if you're a player of Dixit, for example, where an abstract image on a card is used as inspiration for the players to create stories um, and, and, and they really drive the game. So it's not enough to just play with Euro uh, game sort of strategy, um, you also need to uh, unlock your imagination and creativity in order to really excel at this game. And that's not as hard as it seems, you know, lots of people seem to be anxious about will I be able to cope? Um, and it's not that hard, you know, uh, it, it, it really is about being brave enough to, to get in there and have a go. Um, uh, and if you're, a, if you're a player familiar with games like Once Upon a Time or um, Nano Fictionary is one that I've played a bit, um, then, or even a role-playing game, you know, a, a player of RPGs, um, then you're not going to find this stuff too taxing. Um, but the board game mechanics help those players who aren't familiar with those sort of games. Anyway, let's have a little look at what's in the box. Uh, we'll have a look at the components and talk a bit about how the game actually plays. So the first thing that I want to do uh, before I start to show you about how you play Winter Tales is just show you the components that you get inside this rather large box. Now unfortunately the first major component that you get inside the box is quite a lot of air. There's not that much in here, but what we do have is of a very high quality. Um, so we, we have this lovely thick um, rule book. Um, it's it, it's it's really um, sort of nicely produced. Lots of great graphics, good examples, and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the English in it is not great, and so um, every now and then it's quite hard to actually interpret what's uh, what what it's trying to say. And there's quite a lot of typos in there. Um, but maybe that'll be fixed in the new Fantasy Flight edition. Who knows? But anyway, it's a nice thick rule book. Um, the next thing that you notice when you open a box is these um, player aids. So these, uh, again, nice thick player aids. They're Italian on one side and English on the other. A real nice thick piece of card with a real sheen to it. Um, unfortunately, uh, most of the information that you're going to be grasping for throughout the game is not on this reference, which is a real shame. Um, what you're going to be looking for throughout the game is what the characters are all about, what the settings are all about, and what the quests are all about. Um, and so to that end, I did end up actually making my own reference um, with the rules on one side and description of all the different quests on the other. 
Um, that's not necessary. I mean, you can use the, the rule book. That's got all that information in there. The next thing that you notice uh, when you get inside the box and, 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 and put everything out on the table is this fantastic, pretty massive actually, um, map. This board, good thick board, lots of space, very functional um, and extremely pretty. And the board shows us a series of different destinations. So we have the Fair of Wonders, uh, we have an abandoned puppet theatre, we have the Winter Prison, the Nightmare Factory, the Mad Hatter's Asylum, the Oaks Park, which is an abandoned wood, and the cemetery, and Dorothy's Mansion. So, I mean, this is great stuff. This is a lovely board. And down the bottom here, we have a space to place cards, which act as memories of quests that have gone by. So this keeps a track of our story and allows us to reincorporate elements that have come before. The other great thing about this region here is that we can have a variable length. Um, your average game will be three quests long, but you could go considerably longer and make the game much bigger than, uh, than it is in its basic form. So that's quite nice. This game is uh, customizable. You can, you can do what you like with it, really. Over here, we have the player pieces, these are nice thick cardboard tokens um, with images of the different characters on, uh, and they all correspond to the cards that we have here. So this top one, these are tarot-sized cards, like you'd get an Elder Sign. Um, this is Mangia Fuko, uh, who in the Disney cartoon of Pinocchio is known as Stromboli, um, so he's a Pinocchio character. And the, the graphics on these cards are fantastic. Uh, you'll notice in the bottom corner they each have a special ability um, and that's different on most of the different characters. On the back, I've stuck this uh, story on the back, um, on the back of the sleeve at least, I wouldn't damage the original card. Um, but uh, e each character has a backstory that's in the rule book, and as I say I don't want to be grasping for it throughout the game so I've stuck them on the back of the card and I find that quite useful actually because it means that a player can read out the story the first time they activate this character and it gets that use, that player used to speaking in front of the group, telling stories and also sets the scene for everybody else. So that was Mangia Fuko. We now have Dorothy, who's now an old lady after the events of The Wizard of Oz. Um, we've got the cat and the fox from Pinocchio. Um, we have the big bad wolf, the scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz. Alice, and this is an example of the sort of twisted fairy tale world we're in, that Alice is now in a straitjacket and has spent some time in a mental asylum. We have Candlewick, who was Pinocchio's best friend in the original story, but now is a evil character. Um, and that, that carries through the Mad Hatter, he's evil. Snow White, she's evil. <laughs> Pinocchio, he's not so evil, um, but, uh, but he factors in the game. Then we have the little match girl, Grumpy the dwarf, the evil white rabbit, and the tin man. So lots of variety through lots of characters. And the other variety in the game comes through use of these quests. So each of these tokens um, represents a different type of quest. This quest is called Armed Retaliation. This one is the frozen horror, um, the great artefact, the safe house. Um, this one's all about friendship and companionship. Um, so every story is going to take a different sort of turn, a different feel, depending on these, um, these, these individual quests. And the tokens are nice, good quality, thick tokens. We've got more tokens over here, which give the players extra powers. We've got tokens to determine who is the, um, the currently active player who is the story arbiter, the person who gets to decide whether the story is making sense or not, um, a bookmark token, you know, good stuff. And then a big pile of cards, and these cards are the story cards. These are what we're going to use to inspire us when we're telling the story. So these all have different images on, abstract images that we could interpret in a, a thousand different ways. Um, on one side, they're in this reddish colour, which means that they're being played by the good guys. If they're playing, played by the bad guys, they'll play it on the white colour, though the image is the same. 
So uh, here we have another one. You know, we could interpret this as, you know, a, a fight, or we could interpret it as a group of people helping somebody, or as a forest, or you know, whatever you want. You can you can use these cards. Perhaps this is a cat. Perhaps it's a king. Perhaps it's someone looking out of a window. Perhaps they're going in, looking in a cupboard. Perhaps they found an escape hatch. You know, we don't know. It, it, it comes down to you and your imagination as you use them. Is this a tin man? Is it a bird? Um, is it a, a tent? Is it a teepee? Is it a bell? You know, you can interpret these really widely. Some of them are more literal than others. Here, I think you're going to be hard-pressed to find anything to say about this apart from a fire. Um, but perhaps it could be a rocket, um, or, or it could just depict a house, um, you know, and you can use it in multiple different ways. Um, so here we are, more examples of these cards. Unfortunately, what you tend to find is that you get through these cards quite quickly, although there's a large pile of them. It looks bigger here because I've got them in sleeves. Um, but you do tend to get through them quite quickly and find the same pictures are coming up. As you can see here, we've got two of this... Um, cross or plaster or whatever it is and when they come up players do tend to find it quite hard to reinterpret it as something different to what they've said previously it would be nice to have more of these cards and maybe future expansions if the game does well will bring those i think that would be nice um it, it, it's good that these cards have these childlike images that are, are quite easy to interpret i think i think that's good anything more literal would make the game much more um uh, boring I think and then there's these cards over here which give different types of objectives for the good side the bad side um, which you can play in a sort of advanced game the game offers you modules uh, extra rules that you can incorporate into the game um, if you want to make it more more like a traditional board game really you know so so set objectives powers that the, the the characters start off with powers that they can gain through completing quests these will all be familiar things to um traditional board gamers and particularly euro gamers um so so it's a nice feature that they've incorporated those i think what we'll do now is have a little look at how we play this game and i'll, I'll show you a sort of sample um round of the game because that's the most common thing that seems to be asked on Board Game Geek, is how exactly does this thing work? It, it, it looks great, but will I be able to cope? Um, so let's have a little look at that, how the game might actually play. I've set up the board here as if for a three-player game. Um, so in a three-player game, each of the different players will have four characters, and one of the players will be the writer, which means that he's a neutral player. Um, so he controls both good and bad characters. In this case, he's got the little match girl, Dorothy, Mangia Fuko, and the Mad Hatter. Now, the writer's aim in the game is to bring everything to a draw. He wants the game to end neutrally. This character is playing four evil. Uh, this player is playing four evil characters: Snow White, the Wolf, Candlewick, and the white rabbit. And the player here has got the spring characters, the good characters, which are the Tin Man, Grumpy, Pinocchio, and I think this is Alice that we've got here. Yeah. This token just means that this is going to be the first player to activate his characters. Each player is given four story cards to start the game. Uh, except for the writer. Now the writer only gets as many story cards as there are players of each faction. On a player's turn they can activate one of their characters so I think I'm going to start off by taking Pinocchio and activating him. So Pinocchio uh, who is currently in the puppet theatre his controlling player will receive four new story cards from the story card deck. So these get added to that player's hand um, uh, immediately on activation. Now what I like to do at this point is get the players to read out um, an introduction to the character um, the first time that we play it to introduce us to Pinocchio, but we won't do that now. So Pinocchio is activating. He has four 
new cards for his player. Now, bear in mind, this player needs to use these cards for all of the characters. It's not all for Pinocchio. Um, so we don't want to go overboard with playing these cards. But these cards are going to be used as resources. And Pinocchio now has the choice of either moving around the board, which will cost him cards. It costs two cards, oh, sorry, one card to move two spaces. Or to undertake a quest, and currently he's in a location with a quest, um, or to place a new quest onto a different space of the board. Now, because he's here, I think he's going to undertake this quest. And so that means that he's going to need to play cards and describe what he does to undertake the quest. Um, this quest is called the Great Artifact. That's what this uh, image represents here. So what we need to think about is what exactly that artifact might be. He's in a puppet theatre, so what I call, um, using the sort of improvisation term, circles of expectation, tell us that in a puppet theatre we're likely to find marionettes, we're likely to find wood um, carving tools, um, all, all manner of things to do with the theatre, so whether that's lighting or curtains or or seats, um, or box office tickets, you know. But here, I think what we're going to say is that this great artefact is some form of puppet that Pinocchio is looking for. And let's reincorporate his old dad, Geppetto, the puppet maker, who perhaps before he died told Pinocchio that he was creating a brother for Pinocchio, a new puppet that was going to be a great warrior. Now, this puppet has never been seen, because since Geppetto has died... Uh, no one's known where exactly it is. Anyway, Pinocchio is going to try and undertake this quest of finding this puppet. So what he does to do that is he takes the cards um, from the, his controlling player and has a look through and, 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 and tries to use these cards to tell the story. So perhaps we say um, the puppet theatre was long ago burned down by the winter soldiers um, and left in ruins, a sort of rubble. And Pinocchio has spent subsequent years trying to build this puppet theatre back up. But at the time, many items were looted from the puppet theatre, stolen um, by the winter soldiers, and so not much remained. But Pinocchio has high hopes that his brother, the warrior puppet, will still be found. What Pinocchio does know about the theatre is that there are several levels to it, and he's not fully explored these levels because of the, the, the danger um, of going below, beneath the floor, for example, into the basement, or going high into the lighting rig, which is where Pinocchio is going to go and look for the puppet first. So Pinocchio um, goes up into the lighting rig uh, and, and starts to look for this puppet. Now, at this point, he's going to leave these four cards because he doesn't want to use up his whole hand at this point because it will leave his controlling player not much to do later in the game. So, at this point, it's left open for other characters to activate. So perhaps the player controlling the Winter Forces chooses to activate Candlewick because he's nearby. So Candlewick might choose to move into this space. Now, we should have on here a token to say that there is currently a quest ongoing in this space. Um, Candlewick will, by activating, his, his controlling player will receive an additional three cards for activation. So these get added onto his pile of cards there. And Candlewick will spend one of these cards in order to move up to two spaces. So he's going to discard this odd fish card here. And you'll discard that to move into the space. Now Candlewick gets a chance to tell his bit of the story and how he tries to prevent Pinocchio from finding um, this other puppet. So perhaps Candlewick is aware of the location of the puppet. When, he, when the Winter Soldiers looted the puppet theatre, they found a letter which described this puppet. And although they didn't find a puppet themselves, they know where it is. Candlewick sees through an open window what Pinocchio is up to, and he spots that he's currently in the lighting rig. So Candlewick finds his way into the theatre, and he surprises Pinocchio, and pushes him off the rig, and Pinocchio falls 
um, to the floor. At this point, um, Candlewick's minions crowd into the puppet theatre to grab hold of Pinocchio. Okay, at this point, Candlewick's going to leave it open for other players to activate and maybe join in with this battle. So it would be over to the writer player now, who, remember, controls evil players and good characters. So the writer could choose here to activate one of his characters. Perhaps he could activate the Mad Hatter because he's nearby. But in order to do that, it's going to cost him cards. And at this point, he doesn't really care who wins this quest because his aim is to come to a neutral finish. And one way or the other, one team is going to be ahead here. So, he's not going to activate the Mad Hatter, and he's going to leave it for these two characters. Um, again, the good player could, at this point, try and bring Alice into the play, but he's going to lose cards by doing that, so he thinks, no, he's going to be all right. Currently, the good player has played four cards, and the evil player has played four cards. This means, currently, this quest is at a draw, but Pinocchio gets one last chance to play a card, and what we're going to say is that as he falls from the lighting rig, the floor has been weakened um, by the previous damage to the theatre, and Pinocchio falls through the floor and into the basement, where he finds the body of his abandoned brother, um, the puppet, the warrior puppet, um, so, in doing this, Pinocchio has completed his quest, and when we look at the number of cards that have been played, we find the spring players have played five, the winter players have played four, so the spring players win, and they complete the quest. So that means we gain this token here for the spring players, and that gets placed here. We gain a memory of the quest, which uh, goes onto the memory track here, and this is the body of the puppet. And then we briefly sum up what has occurred, and we say Pinocchio has found the body of his um, long-lost brother, which he hopes to um, rebuild and, and hopes can be a powerful force for good in this oppressed um, winter world. The other thing that happens is that the good guys now gain this power, which is to utilise this particular memory in uh, subsequent stories. So that's what this great artefact power is all about. So that's how a quest works. Um, obviously they get more complicated the more players that get involved and the more characters that get involved. And the other things that can interrupt it are traps and battles, which occur either when a um, winter character moves into a spring character's space, then they could have a trap, or they could be trapped, or Conversely, when a um, spring player moves into a winter space, then a battle can ensue. Now, these are similar concepts, but they work slightly differently. In a trap, um, players will secretly bid cards against each other and see who plays the most cards in order to win. Whereas in a battle, um, it's a more a case of I play one, you play one, I play one, you play one, until eventually somebody gives up all the time, of course, telling a story about what's occurring um, during this battle or trap. But both are essentially forms of auction or bidding, using cards to determine a winner. After three quests have taken place, uh, in a standard game we get to the epilogue, although, as I said before, the game is variable in length and we could go much longer. During the epilogue, players play all their remaining cards, and um, uh, the winner is determined by how many cards were played during that epilogue by each side, plus three points for each quest that has been won by each team. Of course, this isn't a game about winning or losing, and if you play it to win or lose, you're going to miss out on a lot of the, um, the sort of nature and feel of the game. It really is a game about telling a great story, and, uh, and, and, and putting your sort of ego aside, and being generous enough to the other players to allow yourself to lose as a character if it's in the best interests of the story. Um, and uh, that's where it's going to be a big shift for a lot of board gamers um, in allowing yourself to lose and allowing yourself to be open enough to build on other players' ideas, accept their offerings and not shoot them down. You know, if a, cre if a character creates a fantastic object, 
don't destroy it in your next turn because that object could become a pivotal part of the story. Accept that object, build on it, use it, reincorporate it throughout the story and you'll create something much more satisfying. Um, you don't want to negate what's gone before but instead you say yes and you build on um, what the other players are giving you even if they are from the opposing side. And that's the, that's the very nature of a storytelling game. I've talked a little bit about um, how to play Winter Tales and what the components are like. Um, I should say this game is uh, for three to seven players, so it really has that in its favour. There's not that many games which go up to seven players and uh, still provide uh, a really enjoyable and fairly deep game in a reasonable time frame. Um, but you can get through a game of this in an hour and a half. And the game is actually um, customizable. You can take longer or, or keep the game short, depending on what you want to do. Um, so, so that's a really nice feature of it. Um, it's not a game that everybody is going to love. Okay, If you're really hard set on, on winning the game, then this is not going to be a game for you. Um, it's a game that the group really has to come together and, uh, and, and approach as a kind of collaborative, almost cooperative exercise in telling a great story. And the rule book um, repeatedly talks about that and it's the only way that it's ever going to work. If players start um, battling with each other and contradicting each other's stories, then the whole thing will fall apart. Um, but there are mechanics in there, there are modules which make it easier for competitive players to really get into the, into the schemes of it by giving their own characters rewards for completing quests or um, different objectives and uh, abilities. So that all makes it a lot more familiar. This is not complex stuff, but it does have a long rules explanation and it's going to be unfamiliar to a lot of players. So uh, it's going to take a while to set it up and get people into it. I think that um, the, the, the video, the promotional video, which has been put out by uh, the company, Alve Pavo, um, and you can see it on BoardGameGeek or on their, their website, that is a great tool. That really does show players very quickly what the theme of the game is, uh, basic idea of how the cards are to be used. Um, it's dark, it's creative, um, and it's beautifully produced. So I, I will often show players um, that little promotional video before we actually play it, just to get them into the feel of the thing. Um, it might be a game that I think a game that it's a game that children could play, but uh, but it, there is complexity there, and they're going to need a lot of guiding through it. But as we know, children's imaginations are going to run riot with this sort of thing, and and, and they're going to love it um, from that perspective. Some of the scenes may be a little dark if they're younger. You know, we have electric shock therapy and uh, torture and, and, and those sort of um, elements of a story about oppression and war, I suppose. Um, but but the, the fairy tale characters are going to be familiar and it, it's going to work with a family crowd and a non-gamer crowd um, as long as they're okay with the slightly darker sort of subject matter. How does it relate to other storytelling games? Um, it's not really like what we've seen before. Um, if you think about uh, a game like Dixit, um, Dixit Odyssey, uh, I mean a game like Dixit, it, it, it's called, uh, that the characters in this are called storytellers, the players are called storytellers, but it doesn't really involve any storytelling. It involves uh, naming cards, you know, giving them uh, titles and interpreting sort of abstract images and beautiful images. So, uh, I mean, in that, in that sense, it, it, it is similar to, um, to uh, Winter Tales, but this is not really true storytelling, although it's a fantastic game. It's one of my very favourite games. This is a party game, and Winter Tales really is not. There's something much deeper going on in Winter Tales than you'd see in a game like Dixit. Um, Dixit was followed by a game called Fabula, which I haven't played, but like a lot of other storytelling games, Fabula... Um, First and foremost, it needs a, a games master, which um, Winter Tales does not, and uh, has the concept of judging uh, other players' stories, which I think is difficult for some players, um, because it can lead to bad feeling. No one wants to be told, my story is better than your story. Um, and the beauty of Winter Tales is that it avoids that. Uh, another game which I've had fun with in the past is this one, uh, Nano Fictionary, um, which... 
again, we're judging each other's stories, but they're short, they're light, they're silly. Um, what they are not is beautiful, okay? These are sort of little hand-drawn images. I didn't draw these. These are the, uh, the Finnish sort of published um, cards. This is a Looney Labs game who also did Flux. Um, it's fun. It's short, um, but it's, it's not, again, it doesn't have the depth that you get in a game like Winter Tales. The other sort of, uh, and I suppose this is where, this is where um, the, the sort of area that we're in with Winter Tales is the one-shot um, RPGs, which are things like, um, what do we have here? We've got Microscope. Um, there's another very popular one called Fiasco, um, which mimics the Coen Brothers movies. These are a, a short books, you know, they're not like an RPG book that you've seen before. They don't tend to require a games master. Um, you can play it just in, a, in an hour or a couple of hours and that's it. There's no campaign, um, although sometimes they can be built up into a longer thing. Another very simple one is um, called Doe, um, Pilgrims of the Flying Temple. Um, which is simpler even than Winter Tales, you know, uh, th these one-shot RPGs really feel like the same sort of uh, world that we're in with Winter Tales, although without the beautiful artistry to go around, um, around it. Another thing you might want to look at if you're interested in these sort of things is um, the Story World uh, books. Sto well, I say books, they're like um, little sets of cards, Story World. These aren't games, but they are storytelling aids where you get these beautiful cards with beautiful artwork um, all describing different situations to do with a certain theme. So here we have the great experiment. And then on the back of the card it has a series of questions um, which help you to tell the story. So why are some creatures running away? Who might have tinkered with the experiment? And what's about to appear? You know, these sort of things. They're, they're great for kids. If you could throw a bunch of these cards together and try and create a story out of it, that's the realms that we're in with Winter Tales, but with a board game, um, board games mechanics to help you along the way and drive the action. I don't have a lot more to say about Winter Tales. It's um, a fantastic game. I think I've given you all the reasons why you'll know if it's suitable for you and your group or not. Um, and as I say, it's not going to be for everybody. Um, it, it, it's different with different numbers of players. I think it works particularly well with an odd number of players because we have this writer mechanic, the player who's trying to force things towards a draw, which really balances any swings between the, the, the bad side and the good side and, and keeps the story interesting. It's beautifully designed so that, um, that there's a natural rhythm as the good guys um, uh, excel, then the, the bad guys um, start to start to fight back because the good guys will be running out of cards at that point and so there's a natural back and forth and it culminates in the epilogue where all players finish off with their final cards and then we count them up and we see which side has won. Uh, I mean that's a, it's a clever mechanic um, and it's just one example of the, the, the great things that the designers have come uh, have done in, in making this um, into a fantastic storytelling exercise.